and I want to say thank you to every single one of you who has chosen to be here today, who's made the trek down to Meridian. This is a city that's very near and dear to my heart as a rural advocate. It brings me great joy to see people from all across the United States gathered here today. And I'd like for you to give yourself a round of applause, if we could start off with that. Thank you. So, we good to go? Okay, great. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Madison Ned Butler. I'm the communications manager for the Rail Passengers Association. I was also the principal author on the Congressional Food and Beverage Working Group report. It's about a 100-page report that we submitted to Congress earlier this year outlining different strategic planning and modeling um, methodology to improve onboard service. Uh, before I joined RPA, I attended Escoffier, where I was a graduate with honors, and I'm a certified project manager through the College of San Mateo. And I used to be a process developer for both Edible Results and Zero Cater. Edible Results is sort of a kitchen nightmare style um, consulting service where we would go into catering groups and, and kitchens and large scale production groups to talk about methods of improvement to retain existing clientele and expand business uh, across the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, and when I was with Zero Cater, I specialized in uh, development for clients that were over 250K ARR that had offices in San Francisco, Austin, DC. Uh, companies like Google and Apple, um, Amazon, Salesforce. So this is something that I was really excited to jump into when I was assigned to the congressional group. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the timeline of this work, because as you all know, all forms of rail advocacy, it's, it's a long process. It's not something that's going to happen in a week, but maybe in a decade. So I'd like to present a little bit of that for you today. I will do a little tap dance. Let me know when we got it back up. Oh, I don't sing. This is not karaoke. <laughs> we did pad the schedule. <laughs> Are we back? Great. Okay, so I joined RPA in the summer of 2019. I was the correspondent for Summer by Rail, uh, traversing 25 cities in 50 days, all on board Amtrak. Uh, so I think I can say that I have taken pretty much every route possible at this point. I think I have three left that I haven't completed um, based on the current network. So after that trip, we had launched a campaign in, during our um, Real Nation conference in Sacramento what passengers want. And so we did an external survey modeling um, by talking to everybody who follows our hotline, our social media. So we were able to reach about 50,000 people uh, to engage in the survey. We had a 70% open rate for the survey. And we were asking similar questions to the questions that Amtrak was asking in their customer service survey, uh, but a little more pointed and a little more directed to see if we could get into the meat and potatoes that people so desperately wanted back in the traditional dining car. Uh, I always use these two examples, um, which is most important to you, and do you think coach passengers should have an access to a complete meal on all rides? And as you can see, an overwhelming majority of passengers, I think it's 92.6% in just our initial outreach, confirm that they do in fact want access to a complete meal on board all routes. Uh, so we compiled this information in the fall of 2019, I worked alongside Jim and Sean, uh, to begin the process of repealing the MICA amendment. John MICA had created an amendment saying that Amtrak food and beverage must turn a profit, which has not only been detrimental to the onboard staff, but detrimental to the overall execution um, of both the flexible dining and traditional dining menu. So, once we compiled that research uh, and began that process, uh, you know, the pandemic hit, and so I was responsible for virtualizing all of the processes for the association, and that includes both national meetings, all of our communication, and finding new ways for our advocates to be able to reach, uh, you know, a, a, an audience in a very, like, tenuous time. Um, and so we had also done a field analysis, uh, Joe Aiello and myself. Um, we traversed the U.S. during COVID um, very safely, testing frequently throughout the process. Uh, and this was at a period when we were seeing uh, three times weekly service for most of the national network. 
in an incredibly um, limited capacity after some of the layoffs that had to happen at that time. Um, from late 2021 to, or, or sorry, late 2020 to early 2021, uh, I helped develop framework for some of the rail sections for the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. I uh, did this alongside Jim and Sean as well, and Jim had come to me and said, you know, with all this research that you're doing, there's a great opportunity for as we're looking to push for new service and expand service to new places to also improve existing service and make recommendations to assure that new passengers become return passengers. We want to assure that every passenger gets what they need to have a good time on board and arrive on time. And so that was a big part of what uh, my responsibilities were within drafting legislation. There we go. Uh, so in spring 2021, um, I created an advocate team to uh, support the legislation in favor of the needed improvements. I'm sure everybody in this room received many, many emails from Joe and myself sort of instructing what it was within the policy that we were drafting that we needed support, we needed advocates to champion. And I think you all did a fantastic job of that. And then in summer 2021, the Superliner refresh began. I was able to join Larry Chesler and his team down in Chicago to take in uh, what the improvements would look like. And so as we're you know, maintaining the existing fleet and relying on the rolling stock that we have, the refresh is a great opportunity to touch up you know, electrical, interior touches, and restore the traditional menu on the Western routes as daily service was coming back into effect. Uh, this correlated with the uh, passing of the IIJA and the development of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And every single piece of policy that Jim, Sean, and I proposed was included in the act, codified by law into the BIL. So I think it was a really big win for us, and I really couldn't have gotten this far without everybody in this room calling and writing to your officials and supporting the work of our small team. So this is just a summary of the language uh, surrounding the passenger experience enhancement. Uh, so section uh, 22208 was something that uh, Jim and I had drafted together. Uh, and the key thing being that informing this food and beverage working group, that it also directs Amtrak to establish it to include nonprofit organizations. Um, and we did this very intentionally so that RPA could have a seat at the table. But we were also able to bring in a number of union partners, LSAs, people that work on you know, the Acela to the Coastal Starlight, and create an inclusive team that can provide feedback because you know if it's just people on the outside or just people on the inside we're not going to get that same diversity of opinion so i think the team that was chosen was really a fantastic cross representation of uh, the staff at amtrak and those of us who are most passionate about advocacy so we began our work on the food and beverage working group in the summer of 2022 and we divided into three teams so we had current situation uh, best practices, and future focus. And in any consulting, you want to make sure that you sort of split up, you know, what are the sources of the issues and who is best um, enabled to, to sort of like go over them, triage them, identify pipelines where we can improve progress over time. So the current situation team was comprised of a number of onboard staff who were able then to report directly to the working group and provide us you know, both anecdotal and evidence-based feedback as to what they needed immediately. Um, and then best practices, I led a good portion of the work done by this team, but how do we redevelop what our standard operating procedures are in a way that best supports the needs of passengers across a myriad of different types of services, different topography, different culture? Uh, and future focus, and this team uh, was led by William Wang, who is the head of Young Professionals in Transportation. Uh, and so he actually went overseas and spent a number of months in China, Japan, stopped in Europe on the way back to look at what the future focus was for groups like, uh, like the ones that run the Shinkansen or Deutsche Bahn or Chinese high-speed rail and really get some one-on-one -on -one time with the people that are making those decisions over there to see how that could be transcribed here and applied here. Um, so in the fall of 2022, as we you know, had daily service back, except for you know, those limited routes, uh, we released another survey and we had about a 50,000 reach on this one as well. So what we were kind of doing was contrasting the Amtrak Medallia survey model with the feedback we get from our people because RPA members typically spend more and ride more miles than the general public, you know. 
not just the train enthusiasts and the foamers, but many of our advocates rely on Amtrak as their primary mode to reach conferences like the one we're at today. So we got some really good information back from that. And we also had an employee survey towards the end of the year. We worked with a number of leader organizers um, within the unions to get, you know, what do the invested union groups need as well? Where are the gaps where they're not getting what they need in order to provide and execute a fantastic service? And, you know, the more that we began compiling this data and looking at how everyone responded, the more the same sort of themes kept popping up. And it kind of cleared up our mission. So we compiled all this information, met in the spring of 2023. We had a fantastic tour of Chicago Union Station talking about the improvements there, you know, went down to the yard, got to look at equipment, and meet with mechanical teams to understand what's going on with the, the rolling stock that's struggling to get back into the field, or what about this equipment is causing problems? You know, like electrical, for instance, if you plug in a coffee pot and turn on the microwave at the same time, you want to assure that both things work. So it was really interesting to get to hear firsthand, you know, these are the issues that we see most often, and that helped to advise sort of that last section of the report. And we did end up with uh, about 100 pages all said and done. So pretty, pretty robust stuff. Uh, we submitted on May, uh, it was May 6th of 2023, uh, and we've had great reception so far, and I'd still want to encourage everyone to reach out to their officials, um, as there is six months left for uh, an official or sorry, six months, no, three, three weeks, three weeks left before we we're supposed to have an answer from Amtrak. So this is included on the one pager that's on the table. Um, for those of you who are joining virtually, you can go to railpassengers.org slash FBWG info, and you'll be able to look at the materials that we're looking at in the room currently. Uh, so by implementing the recommendations advised by the experts amongst the FBWG, uh, we found ways that Amtrak can become more effective in delivering services that satisfy expectations uh, of passengers who are on long distance, state supported, and the NEC. Uh, this comes down to like clearly defining the service line strategies uh, and finding ways to draft SOPs that differentiate types of service, um, creating a shared vision for the future, uh, and to share it and build support within the workforce to encourage those on board to champion, to create delight, to feel good and informed and empowered as they step on the board and clock in, uh, and then to implement the business model, communicate the model, establish the process, train all employees. And this is something I've seen um, in a number of consulting jobs that I've had where you have like a national representation with a number of different models all working in tangent. So, you know, we were very, very clear and explicit in how that division of service could better empower and better streamline operations. So I'd like to dive into what we have on the pages just a little bit. Um, so as I said, defining the vision strategy for all three service lines. Another big one, and I think we've gotten a tremendous amount of support from Amtrak, F&B, as well as passengers, but elevating the cafe car service capacity and having a menu that features healthy, fresh food, uh, updated equipment, and a crew-centric approach to F&B performance. So including things like um, your, your cafe car attendant should know what the wines taste like on board, what kind of beer is served, how much sodium there are in the bag of peanuts versus the cup of noodles. And so by updating technology that's used on board, uh, looking at tablet-based models where that information is readily available at your fingertips, then they're more able to answer questions, you know, am I allergic to this? Is this within my dietary plan? And assure that level of execution that is already expected across trains um, all through Europe and, and across a lot of Southeast Asia. Um, so a comprehensive food and beverage experience. And for this to be across digital platforms, at stations, and on board, providing customers with precise and timely information while enhancing the digital experience for employee use. So again, using those tablets, but also doing what we need to with Amtrak IT to assure that the menu you're seeing online is in fact reflective of the service you're gonna get on board. You know, even looking at coming down, I spoke to a number of people in the city of New Orleans who said, well, what I saw online and what I got in the field wasn't exactly the same. And so just clearing that up, I think would really help to assure that people are gonna spend more money on board too. So food safety compliance, uh, clear ingredient listing. This is something a number of uh, disability advocates have asked me for, um, you know, with a concern that you could be 
hours away from an actual hospital in the event of anaphylaxis? Is there someone on board who's trained to respond? And what can we do to eliminate that from even being a potential uh, situation to be de-escalated or medicated? Um, and of course, installing and operating satellite Wi-Fi on board all trains. This is a request we've been through. It's something that I think could potentially come into fruition with the new fleet. Um, and we had William talk to a number of people who work with different types of satellite internet providers uh, to map out sort of what an RFP for that would look like. And we have offered that RFP overview uh, to the people who will be responding to this at Amtrak. Um, and also retrofitting existing cars and maintaining the fleet while we await the new fleet's arrival. Uh, and then aligning the third-party vendor staff roles on board so that way the people in the commissary know exactly what to expect and the guys who are bringing in, you know, local products or, or supply for traditional dining know where to go, who to talk to, and reduce those margins around, you know, food waste and onboard waste. Um, and we spent uh, a solid day with the sustainability program team, and I think they have some really, really great ideas. So we pretty much just took what they already wanted and ran with it in our final report. Um, but looking at recycling, sustainability, waste control, where are options where something could be compostable as opposed to made of plastic or styrofoam, and sort of factoring in the biodegradability uh, that should be inherent in food and beverage service. And we also discussed establishing management practices to deliver high quality customer experience within uh, the food and beverage teams and establishing a rapid cycle process for evaluating new menu items um, and new products. So if something's not selling, let's put it on clearance, turn it over, replace it with something else. And having a life cycle established and changing up the menu gives something really fun for people on board. It brings an element of novelty and who doesn't love a seasonal menu? You know, I've always had in my experience as a chef and my experience as a consultant, when you go with the flow and enjoy the local flavors and really celebrate what makes each of these routes so special, you're going to have people spend more money. And, you know, much like uh, Mayor Dan said, you know, they're going to get on board three, four times a year. And that's something we really want to encourage. And our final point, and this is something that I would really personally appreciate if every single one of you would reach out to your representatives, to your senators, and let them know that the reestablishment of the Amtrak Customer Advisory Committee to meet the needs of the modern American passenger is essential. There was a lot of information that I got from looking through the archived materials of the ACAC. It's a program that was suspended during COVID. Uh, and I would really like for this to not go the way of the Gulf Coast train where 17 years from now I'm asking if the ACAC can be reestablished. I think having that external perspective can help to eliminate an internal bias um, within different, different departments within Amtrak. And having a method for passengers, especially those who are most committed, those who are spending thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars a year on board, uh, to have those voices have a place and it's something that I really hope to lead in the coming days. I have a lot of support from Representative Cohen, uh, who has asked directly a number of times to reestablish this program. So that is something I'm very much hoping for. And the, the other part of system-wide is um, communication incentives to celebrate the wins. When we have a good experience on board that should be celebrated by Amtrak social media, it is an inherent passive way of having digital marketing that meets the needs of the web 2.0 community that meets the needs of millennial and Gen Z passengers as we're seeing them come on board. But normalizing, you know, great trips and celebrating great trips is something we want to see more of in communications externally. So I'm going to just break these down real quick because I really want to save time for Q&A and hear from you guys. So we're going to run through this at a bit of a clip. Um, long distance, primary goal, open the dining car across the national network with a traditional menu and access to the dining car for all passengers, regardless of ticket class. This is something we've already begun, the pilot programs along the Western trains, allowing you know 12 to 16 coach passengers to come in. I've heard great things from the crews on board that you know people are in a much better mood when they're given that opportunity to come in and dine and keep it at a rate that's fairly affordable. You know, we're looking at a $45 cost for dinner for a coach passenger, so it's a bit of a splurge. But it's not at a point where it's completely inaccessible to most people who are traveling recreationally. 
Um, and I'm also a big supporter of the Just For You program. Uh, I've seen some of the drafts to pilot this program, uh, but it's a way of creating like smaller meals to help reduce food waste on board. So it's, it's kind of a Amtrak specific novelty too. And when I looked at some of the old menus and some of the old Just For You programs, you can see the food waste and the P&Ls on board for the routes piloting that were far more successful than traditional routes that had any sort of breakdown in communication or had issues with on-time performance. So it's something I definitely want to support. And then uh, with a cell in the Northeast Corridor dorm, we talked about just basically revitalizing the standard of excellence for the Acela and what differentiates Acela first class service. And I'd like to think that we got that handled pretty quickly. The star menu is out there in the wild now. I'm starting to hear back on what the new vendor acquisition has been like, both from crews and from passengers. And so far it's been a pretty positive response. So I'm glad to see, you know, that's one, one check in the box in the right direction that we've already established, which I think will definitely help when Congress asks, so what are you doing, given how many of the Northeastern Corridor advocates there are within um, both the House and the Senate. And then for state-supported service. So uh, I've been working with Haley Glenn um, at Vipra in, in Virginia to talk about localized product onboarding and localized product removal. So they're really interested in Virginia. I mean, you know, the pinnacle of the rail renaissance, this is a state that got in early and is continuing to see tremendous growth and return ridership. And so we've been talking to a number of the Safer Sea um, members and supporters about how to create clear language. So that way the state partners can say, this is what we want from Amtrak. It's clearly defined what the roles are and whose responsibility lies where. And it kind of, I think, takes off a burden too, where if the state is to say, this is a Virginia beer, this is a Virginia snack that we want on board, then it's not necessarily the fault of the vendor or the fault of Amtrak if that program, you know, bops or flops. Um, and another thing is just expanded quality control efforts to create just more uniformity through the experiences. You know, we look to companies, I think of like Disney especially, where you know exactly what you're going to expect and what the above and beyond is there. Um, you know, when I was just getting out of college, I worked for Vail Resorts and I did five-star concierge training. And one of the things that they told us is you are always on. You are always on. The script is the script. There could be an avalanche and all the skiers are trapped in here. Well, we're going to have an apres ski. We're going to pop some champagne and we're going to make the most of it. But that sort of constant positivity within uh, quality control is something that can really help to create delight and change you know, what people are going to think when they come back on board. So just to mention it one more time, for those of you who are joining us virtually, uh, railpassengers.org slash fbwginfo, that's going to have the one pager here. Uh, please feel free to send me an email, let me know your thoughts, and jump in the Q&A virtually if you would like to share your thoughts and questions with us. So to wrap this up, well, maybe. There we go. Uh, how to support better service. So uh, we, yeah, we submitted the report May 6, 2023. Um, according to uh, Stephen Gardner in his recent testimony, they will be prepared to respond within the six-month window. I'm going to assume that we're going to get it towards the very, very end of the window, as it is a pretty robust report to address. Um, and I think we've made a really terrific case for the recommendations that we have uh, within the report. So to properly defend uh, those recommendations, I, I think I'm prepared to do that. And I'm really hoping that we see an overwhelmingly positive response because there really is nothing within the report that is like outlandish or unreasonable or something that can't be executed with the existing staff and the existing resources. Uh, so I would really, really support um, all of you reaching out to elected officials, especially those that are on the Commerce, Science, Transportation Committee in the Senate and transportation infrastructure in the House. Um, voice support for onboard improvements, transparency via the ACAC, um, reestablishment of protocols and improvement of management culture. And keep in mind, this is a positive message. You know, we have all put in the work to secure the IIJA, turn it into the BIL, and it has been a bipartisan effort to create a better national network. And supporting these recommendations guarantees that infrastructure is repaired onboard service will improve to meet the growing customer base. So please keep those things in mind. And uh, I would love to turn it over to some questions. 
if you all would like to join me. So uh, we're kind of having a microphone issue. If you would raise your hand, uh, I would like to call them up to the stage, and then we can have a conversation. Chris. I'm going to come on down here, join the masses. Uh, Chris Nadelback from New York City. Um, very good work. Just want to say very, very good work. Um, regarding dining cars, um, you are assuming that all long-distance trains have dining cars. And I think that um, I know uh, 19 and 20 um, don't have dining cars. And um, uh, I think there is somebody from Amtrak within the room. If they could, not you personally, but someone can address... Um, you know, we had a calf order of, I think it was like 50 new, brand new Viewliner dining cars. And it's, to me, it's a shame that a, a trip of 1,380 miles only has half a lounge car and this uh, flexible dining option, which some people call flexible glop. And, um, you know, it goes from one side of the plate to the other. So I think while you're recommendations, I fully agree with them. Open the dining car to coach passengers, restore traditional dining car service. There's got to be an intermediate step This is um, to basically bring back full meal service um, to long distance trains. And one final point, um, Amtrak is not cheap. Okay. Um, I'm from New York. And um, when I was looking to go book a roomette down here, it was like about round trip about fourteen hundred dollars. That's not you know not everybody has that kind of money, and I know um, that I would be furious if I was expecting a dining car on the Crescent and there is none for fourteen hundred dollars. So I just want some other people in the room, particularly people from Amtrak, to comment on that. Yeah. So. I am going to push back just a little bit, Chris, um, in that I have logged over 60,000 miles in the last five years and taken every long distance route, so I'm very aware of where the dining cars are and are not. That being said, obviously, the ones that don't have it, I'm thinking specifically of the Texas Eagle. Uh, <laughs> we're running three cars and in one engine. Uh, yeah, obviously, there are improvements that need to be made there. So I actually met with uh, Representative Cohen's office and his chief advisor, and we discussed uh, pages two through seven of the report, which all indicate um, how many cars there are backlogged that need repair, specifying which ones are dining cars, which ones are sleeper cars, etc. cetera. Um, so I think we have a clear outline of what would need to happen within the next like three to five years in order to put dining and observation cars back on there. And in our surveying, we found that there's about 27,000 people supported the um, expedited restoration of dining cars that are sitting out, you know, in Beach Grove in the Chicago yard, as well as having an observation car on every train that goes over 750 miles. So uh, we're very much aware of that issue. It's something that I am actively pursuing. And having ridden a number of the trains that do have flexible dining, which you're basically taking in your room or kind of sharing space with the crew who's, you know, papers for days across the table, it's not really a welcoming environment. Um, and I've, I've had every single flex meal that has ever been served and everything that was in the test kitchen originally. So I am all about getting us back to traditional dining, making sure that we have room to eat, good company to share it with. Steve, or can you? Yes. I'm going to challenge Chris a little bit too on the sense that it might be fourteen hundred dollars for a, uh, to go the full distance of the Crescent in a in a sleeper. But it cost me, I don't know if it was $21 or $18 to ride from New Orleans to Meridian yesterday. So, the, and the people that got on with me, I don't even know if they could pay $45 for a full, full meal. So you got to also think about the people who are paying $21 to go to Meridian and that's all they can afford. And so they're looking at what does the cafe car have and maybe they get a salad, you know, or you encourage them to get a salad or a whole wheat something or other. Um, I'd like, did, did the committee look at what the union agreement says about cafe car employees? Because in New York and even on the Crescent yesterday, 
we have a big problem on the issue of the cafe cars and the food service doesn't open until well with, it was an hour, over an hour yesterday. In New York, it's often 30 to 45 minutes before they open. Why can't those people like start work 30 minutes earlier or something so that when the car, when the, when service begins, the cafe car can open? Talk about the le- union rules. Yeah, yeah, that's great, great line of questioning, Steve. And something that, too, you know, my consulting experience has all been, like, through private companies, through tech companies, venture tech. So, you know, what we're doing is very different than what you get out of union protection jobs, right? So uh, Priscilla Lumpire is one of the members of the working group, um, is a union rep out in California. She's been up and down the coast on a number of routes, San Joaquin's, et cetera. Um, and so when we took that union survey model, we had responses from 32 states, from people not just from one union, but from a myriad of different roles within um, the long distance service, especially. And so, you know, that was one of the things that we talked about. So when we're looking at how um, management best practices are defined, one of the things they should be looking at is what maneuverability is there within union contracts? What does negotiating and bargaining look like? But that is asking a lot of additional bandwidth of an already limited staff. So I think if, if the union wants to volunteer the changes that they want to see be made, that puts them in a better position to go over those SOPs and review what is and is not within um, like union limits and union agreements. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So um, for those of you at home, he's asking why, why could uh, crews not show up 30 minutes early and have the cafe open as soon as the, um, the ride begins? Um, so uh, there seems to be a little back and forth between different commissaries as to what the load in and load out process is like. I think that's fundamentally what it comes down to is that the maneuverability um, and just like people mechanics within Chicago Union Station is very, very different than it is in Oakland, than it is in other commissaries. Um, And there's also different temperaments. You know, we're kind of like, especially in the South, we're moving at the speed of the South. Sorry, I'm a Southerner. It's just true. We do things a little bit slower. So kind of seeing that, that difference in how people are loading out culturally, um, also plays into it quite a bit. And then there's also the management of like offboarding food and at what time that offboarding happens seems to be pretty inconsistent and it really depends on which commissary uh, the train is loaded and unloaded at. So I will reach out to Priscilla. I can put you guys in contact and let her know that this is something that you have an inquiry about to make sure we get your answers. Yeah. Come up to the. Can you can you come up to the mic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think again, this comes back to management and labor having those conversations to make sure that. Crews have what they need. Passengers have what they need. And the way that management is sharing this information is clearly top down, that there are SOPs that can be easily adhered to that allow for transparent ways to measure those KPIs and make sure that the indications of performance and execution of service is where it should be. Um, you know, and for the go-getters who work in the cafe bar, the people who are ready, they are on the mic. Oh, I'm off the mic. There we go. But they have, you know, they have what they need. They are ready to roll. They are dress pressed. Like their sales are so much better than the people who, you know, don't have a great attitude or a step behind, need to zip their fly, and they get tips, right? So we actually spent a lot of time um, with the lead performing LSAs um, and lead performing cafe attendants uh, across the network, uh, you know, people who have 20 plus years of experience and continually have metrics and sales that exceed their teams. Uh, There's one guy we spoke to. He sold more like by himself in one route than every other cafe attendant combined for both crews. Why? Because he shows up early. He's ready to roll. 
you know, he's, he's adhering to the SOPs. So what do we need to do to encourage those who may not have the same motive, the same drive to get out of bed, to want to engage? And this comes back to the culture, right? Without a revitalization of culture, without clear standards and metrics, without KPIs that build people up and want to retain, then you're not going to have any initiative to want to come early. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, when I think about, um, like, especially my time at Zero Cater, uh, I was managing, uh, whew, like, 520 um, different people who were all part of our service model. So what we did was have local restaurants work with big businesses to cater. So, you know, I mean, nobody wants the same turkey sandwich they've had. Nobody wants the, the conference chicken they've had a million times, right? So especially in Austin, there's such a great local restaurant scene, but they don't have the infrastructure, the resources to, you know, provide for Google without somebody else handling, you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable, SOPs, um, you know, equipment delivery. So we facilitated all of that. And by giving those people the tools to participate in a much greater and larger way than they had the capacity to within their own staff, uh, we were able to create delight and create something, especially in Austin, San Francisco, LA, DC, that other markets didn't even have. They didn't even have the opportunity to compete with us. And we were able to go from Series C to Series B funding and retain all of those 250,000 uh, ARR clients for over three years. We had contracts that lasted longer than some of the Amtrak vendor contracts lasted because we had clear definition of roles. We had clear SOPs to follow. And the way that we streamlined our service development and protocol made sense. Yeah, can you, can you come up? Our virtuals can't hear any mic except for this one. We're going to fix this during lunch. Okay, I will hop right on those questions right after this. You mentioned it really briefly already, but the issue of staff using the table space in the cafe cars, um, it's something I think we've all encountered everywhere. You come in, this eight tables, three and a half of them are being used by the staff, and there's nowhere to sit for the people trying to buy things. I can't help but feel like that disincentivizes people engaging with the food and beverage. Is there any innovative idea Amtrak has to not take up all of their customer-facing service space for staff? Yeah, totally, totally valid. I think, I think all of us have experienced that on the way here. So thank you for, for asking. Um, and I will reiterate, I am the, communica the communications manager for Rail Passengers Association. I do not work for Amtrak. I do not know all of the ins and outs. What I would encourage would be to add an additional crew dorm car and allocate clear space. And if we had an observation car, cafe and dining car on every route, we would have space for everybody. So when you get on board's route, like routes like the Texas Eagle, I'm going to keep driving this one home because that used to be my day in and day out ride. I would go Austin, San Antonio, Dallas all the time. And what it was like pre-pandemic versus what it's like now are wildly different metrics of service. But across all trains, if the crew has space that's dedicated that's also going to encourage them to want to be in a better mood, to have, because, I mean, you know how some of our people get. Like, it's good to have a place to escape to, and I think everyone deserves that, especially people that we're asking to, you know, regardless of whether or not they're on time, manage a safe mode of transportation for thousands of people constantly. So I think we need to make sure that as uh, equipment restoration is prioritized and as certain elements of rolling stock move back into the field as we await the new fleet, uh, included with the prioritization of the observation car restored to all long distance routes and the cafe and dining car restored to all long distance routes, that the crew dorms are adequate and that they do have that extra space, even if it's just dedicating a bedroom as like a chill out area. Um, and also the reduction of paper use on board uh, this comes down to having tablets, to having Wi-Fi enabled devices. Um, and I think of service like uh, point of sales like Clover and Toast. These can be used offline. And then when you get back to a major city, upload, pull all your PLs, find out where you stand. This would do wonders to change, I mean, how stock is managed. It would give us real-time analytics of the situation for, for these crews. And, you know, I think about even on the Crescent on the way up from New Orleans, the, you know, this guy just has like, a bazillion papers like all across and it's like okay well yeah I too would probably feel very surly if I was like having to go through all of these checks manually while being surrounded by people who are like where's my sandwich 
So, you know, creating space and uh, having, having clear, healthy boundaries and respect to staff time. Um, we have some online questions. You want to read them? Yeah. Take a photo so you can come up here. Uh, so the, actually, these are two questions, but they're, they're, they are related. Um, first question is, like the fact that you included sustainability. Uh, there's uh, so much single-use materials, paper boxes, that are di discarded on Amtrak trains. Do these recommendations apply to the San Joaquin trains? The rail authority is planning to discontinue dining service for a six-hour train. And it, uh, there was a, the second question was, has there been any uh, feedback from your group on the elimination, elimination that I think they're doing to vending machines on, on the new equipment? Has there been any feedback from, from your group uh, that you've heard from the California folks? Yeah, uh, great questions. And I would just love to encourage everybody to look at the um, Amtrak sustainability team's uh, page on the Amtrak website and also the number of uh, videos they've turned out on YouTube. There's some really, really great material that they want to pilot, but they need support. They need to hear from passengers. We want this. We want this. We want this. So that's one challenge I have for all of you today. Familiarize yourself with the sustainability report, the ADA report, the future projects reports. Um, as far as the San Joaquins, um, Sean Jeans, Gail, and I have been in conversation uh, with those teams and talking about what new modes of service would be like. I don't know if we have a definitive answer at this point. Um, and we're kind of looking at what they're doing versus what the requests of Safer C have looked like. Because uh, state supported, again, this comes back to having a, a, an SOP that makes sense, standardized protocol. Um, so I'll be interested to see what happens there. And if it is a vending machine um, option on the San Joaquins, then maybe this is an opportunity for stations to step up and provide local food, you know, have food trucks, have local vendors, have grab and goes, much in the way that we see uh, across coastal Japan. Yeah, Ron. A couple of suggestions that I have is, uh, and I can do this online too. Uh, one is uh, I would like to see a vegetarian option which actually has vegetables rather than. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the second thing is, as far as sustainability, one of the least sustainable things that I've noticed taking Amtrak uh, in recent times is uh, that they have taken out the water tanks or containers for people to fill up and, and give all bottled water. That wastes a tremendous amount of plastic. So that's two things that I, and I can put those suggestions online too, but. Yeah, um, you know, the restoration of the um, uh, potable water was something that the sustainability team did talk about quite a bit while we were with them. I also think this could be a great merchandising opportunity for Amtrak if we all had little, you know, Nalgene's that, you know, we're branded and for our time on the train. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you a thousand percent. And I have eaten that chili like two or three days in a row. And there's a point where you just don't want any more chili. So I'm with you, with you on that. Um, yeah. You and then you. Paul, oh, Nelson. Oh. Yeah. Paul Nelson from Oxford, Mississippi. Fantastic presentation, Ned. So really appreciate it. There's a huge amount of hard work. So. And while, and like, incredible, I have not seen something like this. And, you know, from the comments, I appreciate, obviously, dining cars, getting the, repairing cars or better work labor, not having people. I'm for all that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, as somebody who lives in Mississippi, I appreciate my good friends in New York and California all around but the person who gets on the train in Meridian, Mississippi, or Greenwood, Mississippi, or Monroe, Louisiana, or in Natchez at some point in the future, those folks are citizens of the United States, too. And so I appreciate that we need to have a standard in the Northeast or the West Coast, but it also applies to folks like me who grow up around here at a price point we can afford. But I don't want to get into my friends at Amtrak telling you how to run a railroad or do labors. I, that's not my thing. I just want to make sure that when folks from my community get on the train, they have access to a price point they can afford that's a high-quality service. That's all I care about. But, and, but I, will, I want to emphasize to me, other than sell the service and celebrate the service, as Mayor Smith says, the most important thing that you said, other than this great presentation, was the comment where you said every single recommendation that you took was written into the law. 
that's incredible. So I can advocate to my local officials. I can make calls. But we depend on people like you in D.C. to influence. Sean, I know you're back there. That's incredible. Every single thing. So you set the standards and then get thank you. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate that. And I do want to say, you know, I am from Versailles, Kentucky. It is a tiny dot on the map. Uh, we've never had service. The closest thing we had was um, the Louisville route that disbanded in 2003 uh, or go three hours the other way to Ashland. So when I think about, especially ridership demographics in the South, we see a ton of like single moms, young black families, people that may not have the same equity as, uh, you know, our bedroom, uh, bedroom, credit card swiping, uh, steak and potatoes having crowd, right? So given that this is a, a public good, right, that is not required to drive a profit, what can we do within that framework to make sure that we are providing equitable resource, you know, especially for people who it's not, you know, it's, it's not a land cruise. This is how they get to the doctor. This is how they, you know, go see grandma. This is how they get safely home and back to campus. So I'm, I'm a thousand percent with you. And we did talk quite a bit about uh, the affordability of the cafe car. And uh, my colleague, William, at Young Professionals in Transportation, talked a lot about the wage gap and sort of the wealth disparity that's experienced amongst Gen Z and millennials who simply don't have the same financial resources or equity, but want to make sure that they're still getting on board. As a follow-up, you hit on equity. I think all of the mayors and elected officials that I've met you represent your entire community, not just the rich folks in your community or the white folks. You represent your entire community. And so I appreciate that relationship that you have. I don't want to get in the business of telling Amtrak how to do their job. That's just not my job. I have a different job. I just want to make sure that the people that our elected officials represent, which are my neighbors, get taken care of. I want to stay out of telling someone else how to do their job and do my job as a citizen. So thank you for doing yours. Thank you. I'd love to thank Congress for giving me the authority to recommend how some people should do some things. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jerome Trahan, our Mississippi rep, uh, Amtrak retiree. Um, I, excellent work. I mean, amazing work. One thing I... I notice is this, uh, you've landed on a lot of the same principles and ideals that we developed way back in the day for the Crescent Service. I think the thing that's important, just to distill it down, we're talking about the National Railroad Passenger Corporation. We need to think about everything we do has to be relative to that passenger. You can't be on a train for 28 hours and either eat the same chili three times the same $18 chili three times, or uh, if you have a breakdown in service, for example, then those folks are stranded. Our crews do a very good job of recovery, but a lot of the problems we've talked about are all related to budget cuts, you know, staffing cuts, equipment cuts, uh, crew car. You know, that, that was a big fight. Uh, sleepers and dining cars, a huge fight. And I, it just occurs to me that we're, we're leaning toward trying to be profitable when we are a, effectively a nonprofit. And I think uh, all of these committees are outstanding. I worked on Safer Sea. I managed all state supported trains. The states had a lot more leverage than anybody else. I think all of these things have to have teeth. Whether you're compelling a freight train to allow the passengers and the well being of those people on board to have a good experience and move at a reasonable amount of time because as a marketer I can't I can't say the experience is outstanding if you get on the train and then you're four hours late so I think we've got to focus on the passengers and it's that simple and I understand you know that we've tried to come in and be more efficient more like the airlines I flew to DC on Delta it was a great experience but a half a coke and two cookies yeah. is not an experience plus when you're crammed in to the maximum amount of bodies that you can get in a space. So these are, we all know these benefits of rail travel, but again, I, I, I say teeth to these committees um, so that there's some actionable outcome and the passengers, period. Yeah, and 
Yeah, give it up for Jerome. Also, can we just say thank you to Jerome for bringing us to Meridian? Thank you to our council representative who was so active in making sure that we came down and invested in a little town that invested big in passenger rail. Um, so I do want to riff on what you were saying just a little bit. So within the uh, working group, we spoke to a number of people, um, you know, across the globe. I am also the um, American policy advisor for the Travel Smart campaign, which is an international campaign uh, looking to reduce flights and increase rail transit all across the world. It's a massive team. We all work together. We all share research. We're very interconnected. And no one, no one in the entire team talks about expecting a public good to turn a profit. And we've chosen, you know, as taxpayers to elect people who pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we are choosing to to you know, trust Amtrak with the taxpayer money, to trust our elected officials that they are supporting clear policy that's going to keep us competitive in an international market and increase our ability to stay relevant. So you know, at the very base of it, yeah, we have to build equity. We have to look at it from an international standard of execution. And as Jerome said, passenger is right there in the title. So let's focus on the people who are not just generating revenue, but relying on this lifeline to other communities. Thank you. Thank you. All right. How am I doing on time? Uh, you have uh, uh, an extra five minutes. Yeah, please. Um, so equity. Uh, so do the southern routes not have the value tickets uh, cheapest modifiable vouchers, e e refunds that the northern routes, northern rates have that the uh, the Carolinian route has. I, the, I guess I'm a, little, I'm a little confused on that, but yeah. um, I would encourage you to go to Amtrak.com and type in the route and see what tickets are available. Uh, I do not know. I will be honest with you, but I'm sure it's on the website. Yeah, thanks, Ned. Todd Liebman from Arizona. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, I used to cook when I was in college, and so I know a little bit about food service. And I was on the Crescent yesterday, and it's pretty obvious to me that the staffing isn't adequate to serve the uh, customers. There just are not, I mean, those that crew was hustling and putting together those flex meals. Uh, it was just, there just weren't enough staff. I mean, that's a huge undertaking to serve those passengers. And they're just, and that, every time I go on a train and I see the flex, it's always the same thing. They're struggling to keep up. And flex, the interesting thing about flex is it's the least flexible I've ever seen. I mean, <laughs> they knocked on my door at 7.30 in the morning. I was still sleeping with my breakfast. And uh, you, I mean, it's very regimented. You have to eat just at the time that that's being served. So they've got to do something about the flex. Couldn't agree more. I, you know, tasted a lot of the um, initial flex menu stuff in the test kitchen. And there's kind of a difference. Uh, you know, I always think of that meme where it's like expectations versus reality. And so what we had prepared in a, a stable kitchen in perfect conditions is not necessarily what we're going to get on board, especially with old, like older equipment that's like electrical fluctuations. Sometimes the microwave goes out, you know. And having those clear SOPs, like, again, will help. Like, if you know exactly what a standardized preparation is and it's done in the way that, you know, the most successful LSAs who are selling or the most ca cafe attendants who are selling the most product probably know the best methodology of preparation and should be involved in the advising process there. Um, and, you know, I also talked to um, William and Haley on my team pretty extensively about um, what it would take to draft an RFP to look at having pre-ordering. So, you know, the more that the Amtrak app is being pushed, I just think that's it's a huge, easy, easy way to look at, like, controlling spending and anticipating passenger needs and wants by just asking people what they want before they get on board. You know, I, I think about whenever you attend a wedding, you know, you choose, like, the steak, chicken, fish, or veg option. And even just having a parameter like that to work with is going to make crew loadout so much easier. And yeah, you want you'll have last minute joiners on, and you'll have people that are going to come down to the cafe car and decide what they want as you know after they go uh for like forty five seconds. 
But, you know, the more the anticipating what passengers want on board is factored into uh, the IT and the front end of things, the easier it is for those crews to execute with consistency and know the expectations of the passenger as they board. And we have, oh, yes, I'll come to you. Well, or you can come to me. Meet you in the middle. All right, Jerry, even then, and then we'll get Howie. I appreciate that the suggestions you have taken before when I complained. Um, when you have commissaries like in Chicago, I don't know where the other ones are, but we have been on some very, very late trains, and there is no food left. And apparently, there is no way that they can get food, stop for food or anything, and that is a concern. But we did have one chef, because he had, was a chef, chef, who took all the food that had not been eaten and made a delicious stew, opened it up to the, everybody on the train. And I just wanted to say, good for, sh good for chefs that are still left, but I am concerned about the food that's not there when you need it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's like nobody ever wants to have to have the am stew, but it's great to know that there are still chefs out in the field that can prepare it. And I am all for the ingenuity of chefs. I mean, that's a big thing that sent me to culinary school. And I went to a farm to table school where we went tail to end. We used every resource possible and reducing food waste is just a cause that's very near and dear to my heart outside of my beloved friends here in the Choo Choo Club. I also advise like on a number of food waste reduction groups down in Texas. Um, and so, yeah, getting chefs back on board is huge, and that does so much to elevate the standard of service. And like you said, when you're in an emergency situation, having somebody that's serve safe certified and knows how to extract and use every little bit, nobody wants to be in an emergency situation like that, but the more prepared we are, the better. Um, you know, in page, I think it's like 14 through 16 in the report, um, we talked about like the historic menus and how there used to be like chef residencies and chef training programs. What's the feasibility of getting back to that is one of the questions in the report that uh, we hope Mr. Gardner and his team will be able to answer in about three weeks. This trip was the second time I've used the Crescent. The first time was several years ago. At that point, several years ago, I could walk into the dining car with my wife. We could sit down, and in, in the anticipation of having two other people sit at the same table who we'd never met before, who we could have a pleasant conversation with, <clears throat> with real food. Uh, now the trainmen are running up and down the aisles of the entire train with two or three bags of stuff. And if and when you sit in the dining car, you almost feel like you're presenting a problem for the, di for the snack car staff. It's, it, it is not a dining car anymore. And in fact, yes, they were uh, occupying a lot of space with their paperwork uh, during meal hours. Uh, I've experienced a lot of times where they do their paperwork after lunch or before dinner, something of that sort. But this experience with this, quote, flexible dining, by the way, let them know that salt and hot pepper are not the only spices available. Uh, I don't particularly like spicy food, and if I wanted it, there's always this bottle of Tabasco sauce, which, uh, and, and when it's put on everything all the time, it raises my blood pressure for other reasons. Yeah, no, I, there's a point too where it's not just preference, but also like ADA compliance and making sure that we have low sodium, low sugar options, things that aren't just riddled with gluten. Um, you know, so everybody gets a chance to have something that meets their needs on board. Um, you know, when I was with um, Edible Results, we had a group that was a gluten-free bakery, and they were in the process of a national franchising of their concept. And one of the things that they looked at was like, okay, well, if it's already gluten-free, let's go ahead and make it vegan. Well, if it's already vegan, like, 
you know, let's use a waste reductive packaging. And so by taking small steps and doing those prospecting and following those, those leads for development early, um, it put us in a really good, really good place when we finally launched that. And they looked at, oh my God, I think we were like a 14% profit margin in like the second quarter which is really phenomenal for like a bakery. They usually sit around a 2% margin at the end of the year. So just making sure that we, you know, use our allies and hear from people that do this um, and bring them into the RFP process, you know, bring them into the test kitchen, talk about what opportunities uh, there are for sustainable growth and how we can develop something that does create delight and does uh, represent like the desires of the passengers. One more. Anybody who hasn't asked a question yet that would like to ask a question? I was going to get, if anybody who hasn't had a chance yet first, just to be fair. Yes. Come on. You come on up here. Hello, Mr. Board Member. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I missed out on that. I want to acknowledge our elected officials for a second, if I could, just to give that plug. Um, thank you all for being here, and we appreciate um, all your help with our messaging. It's very important. Uh, I didn't make all of your session because we had the Louisiana um, coalition that was here. We actually met across the street uh, between 10 and 11, so sorry. Uh, anyway, when you have people there in a place at the same time, you know, things have to happen like that. But uh, briefly, I wanted to ask to turn this back to get on topic. What about um, in-station amenities and what about some of, the, uh, some of the roadblocks that are there for places like Albuquerque is a great example where if you ever board the Southwest Chief, lots of people want to get off and serve, uh, you know, serve with the vendors uh, that are alongside the train. And what about those kinds of opportunities um, along a multi-day uh, type of route where people want to get out and do something local? Um, and what roadblocks are there to accomplish those things? Yeah, I, that's, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, I've been monitoring the restoration of the food hall at Chicago Union Station um, because I want especially when I'm leaving there. I have a million meetings a day when I'm in Chicago. I want something I can grab, go, get on board. Um, but, I, you know, I think of, like, like Tucson's a great example, where their station is right around all these restaurants, hotels, you know, and I think that comes down to having, um, oof, sorry, to having, like a, um, like, a downtown investment and development plan that is rail-centric, multimodal-centric, right? And, you know, like, what, what we have here, first came the station... Then came the economic development. You know, John Robert Smith mentioned in our workshop for every $1 spent on the station, it's almost a $200 economic return. So I think getting people that understand that to really commit to developing um, you know, a, a hub, a, a cultural center around the station is big. And for stations uh, like Greenwood, for instance, where um, the host railroad is really restrictive on what they want done in and around the building, having some establishment of policy that dictates what is and isn't required to outline what passenger service should look like. You know, so should there be something that says every station needs to have a bathroom, needs to have a place to get food, needs to have Wi-Fi, and what are the many, many mechanics of turning that into something that can be applied across the myriad of different situations for different types of stations. So I think as we look at how, um, you know, federal spending um, happens and how the money that's allocated to station development and station revitalization um, is, is given out to these communities, including in the RFP, exactly what you're talking about. I don't know how much of it can be retroactively applied, but as we're looking to expand and as we're looking to improve, like, to me, that's a no-brainer. That should definitely be at the top of the list. You know, I think about, like, having done 25 cities in 50 days when there's nothing open and nothing around and you're on an incredibly padded schedule arriving at, like, 1 o'clock in the morning. Any option is a good option. 